So good evening. As chairperson of the Endowment Lectures Committee of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, it is a great privilege for me to welcome you to the 30th Srimati Bansari Sheth Memorial Lecture to be delivered today by the Honorable Justice Mr. Rointon Fali Nariman, a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. It is truly a great honor for the Asiatic Society to have an esteemed judge like Justice Nariman in the Darbar Hall to deliver this lecture. We are most grateful to him for having accepted our invitation, especially since we are at the start of celebrating 220 years of our historic society, of which we are very proud. I must add that. Justice Nariman is the quintessential Renaissance man, widely read, deeply analytical, and in touch with the most profound spiritual and moral values that guide sound decisions. We were so fortunate to have him serve in the Supreme Court for seven highly productive years as a voice of clarity and reason across a variety of hot button topics from the right to privacy to the fundamental rights of women. Our courts help preserve that fundamental dignity interest we all have. How can we ensure that our institutions continue to protect our liberties? There is no better guide to this vital question than Justice Nariman. Today, he will talk to us about the checks and balances enshrined in our constitutional structure and how we as citizens can play a role in keeping our democracy alive and thriving. I thank you most sincerely, Justice Nariman. It is also a great honor for us to have in the chair Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, also a retired judge of the, of the Supreme Court of India. Moreover, we know him well. He is a member of our society and a former trustee. Thank you, sir, for being with us. I can see that Dr. Kirti Sheth is with us in the audience. We are grateful to him for having set up this endowment lecture in the memory of his wife to commemorate her role as former honorary secretary of our society. Thank you for your steadfast support over the last 30 years, Dr. Sheth. Before I hand over the proceedings to you, Justice Sri Krishna, kindly allow me to tell the audience a little about this endowment and introduce the speaker and the chair more formally. So, Bansri Bansari Sheth Ne Kazi was born in Bombay. She went to Elphinstone College and took her LLB degree from the Government Law College in Bombay. She taught law at the Siddharth College of Law in the late 50s and early 60s. Bansari Sheth had a close and long connection with the law. Hers was a family of lawyers and founders of leading solicitors' firms. Justice Nana Bhai Haridas was the first Indian judge at the Bombay High Court. His portrait still hangs there. So too, Attorney General of India, C.K. Daftari, he was a member of her family. Bansri Ben went to the USA in 1965 on a fellowship. She returned to India in 69 to restart her own independent practice at the Bombay High Court. She later joined the firm of Tayabji Dayabe Solicitors and remained a partner in that firm until the end. Bansri Sheth joined the Asiatic Society of Bombay in March 1949. She was a managing committee member from 71 and thereafter had a glorious decade from 1975 to 85 as honorary secretary. She was elected no less than five times and she had the distinction of being the first woman to hold that position. Bansri Ben passed away in 1990. Her husband, Dr. Shed, gave a generous endowment to donate a lecture series on society and law, a topic which was dear to her. We have had a galaxy of star legal luminaries who have given this lecture here and Justice B. and Shri Krishna is amongst them. Yes, you had given one in the same series. 
<laughs> if I may remind you. Uh, so, Justice Nariman is a native Mumbai car who went to the well-known Cathedral and John Connan school around the corner from here. And later, he pursued his studies at law school in Delhi and lastly at Harvard Law School for his LLM degree. He returned to India and commenced a remarkably swift rise to one of the senior advocates of the Supreme Court, becoming at age 37 the youngest senior counsel. From 2011 to 13, he served as the Solicitor General of India and then became one of the rare barristers to be directly appointed to the Supreme Court. He authored 360 judgments as a judge of the Supreme Court on diverse subjects, in particular, constitutional law, arbitration and the Insolvency Code 2016. He is acclaimed as an expert in comparative constitutional law and civil law. Justice Nariman has delivered lectures on several subjects over the last many years. The list is far too long for me to enumerate here. He is also an ordained priest and author of three books. If I may just tell you the titles, The Inner Fire, Faith, Choice and Modern Day Living in Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism in Other Faiths and Discordant Notes, The Voice of Dissent in the Court of Last Resort. His other interests include a passion for Western classical music about which he has extensive knowledge. He is an avid reader of history, philosophy, comparative religion and science and enjoys nature walks too. Following his retirement, he has been generous in sharing his wisdom on all these topics. We are just enormously privileged and grateful that he is speaking to us today. I hardly need to introduce Justice Sri Krishna to this audience. He was chairman of our board of trustees and has been an active supporter of all our activities. Justice Sri Krishna was a permanent judge since October 1991. He was appointed as Chief Justice of the High Court of Kerala in September 2001 and as Judge of the Supreme Court of India in October 2002, which office he demitted in May 2006. His name is synonymous with the commission of inquiry he headed to go into the riots that shook Mumbai in December 1992, January 93. The report he submitted in 98 has generated wide debate in India and abroad. He has been invited by the universities of Berkeley and Stanford in the USA, Bar Ilan in Israel, and Oxford University to deliver lectures on socio legal subjects, as also by several universities and public institutions in India. Justice Sri Krishna was appointed by the Government of India as Chairman of the High Level Committee to review the arbitration mechanism in India. He continues to serve our country through his important work on data protection to identify key issues in this area and recommend methods of addressing them. He is widely respected for the work he has done in leading many important national commissions that deal with the most complex issues our country has faced. We are thrilled that he is will willing to make a few remarks after Justice Nariman's lecture today, and we look forward to this evening. Thank you very much, dear sirs, and I now hand over the proceedings to you, Justice Kishi Krishna. Would you like to come here and speak? Thank you, Mina. It is always a sorry, <clears throat> first apology that my throat is absolutely. These are the days when loud voices are not to be heard. <clears throat> Accordingly, my voice has been muted by natural causes. It's always a pleasure to come here to the Shadik Society and take part in 
the events organized therein I spent uh, a number of uh, days in company of all the persons who were office bearers and presidents in my capacity as a trustee of the society. It has been my singular pleasure to have known Rowinton. Uh, I'm sorry, can I speak about you as Rowinton in singular? Not calling you Honorable Justice, blah, blah, blah. Rowinton, from his very young days, young days, <coughs> though by that time I had already become a judge, it has given me great pleasure to hear him across the bar, both in the Bombay High Court and in the Supreme Court, and thereafter, in private conversations, much of which would not be permitted to be leaked out to the public in spite of our having uh, mobile phones. Constitution is as dear to his heart as philosophy. I remember I was present when one of his books was released in the India International Center in Delhi. And I had the privilege of also being uh, presiding over this function, if I remember rightly. He has this uncanny ability to distill fundamental principles. Uh, it was mentioned by Minal just now that he is a student of comparative constitutional law. What does a student of comparative constitutional law do? He takes the essence of the different constitutions, balances each against the other and makes a value judgment. This has become possible for him because he is a student of comparative religion. Read his book which says, all the good things in Zoroastrianism are nothing but moral values taken from various places. Now, I am also eager to listen to him about the checks and balances of the constitution. Uh, we need a lot of checks. Balances we have lost completely, I think. Checks are necessary. And with the help of the elucidation that Rohinton is going to do today, we hope we'll be able to think of it in the right way and take the right path. Thank you very much. Let's now listen to Rohinton. Thank you, Justice Sri Krishna. I am delighted to see Mrs. Kocher this evening. She taught me in school. And I am so happy that her daughter Ragini, who was co-house captain with me, is also here along with so many of my school friends. So it's like a home getting together. It's so lovely to see all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Baron Acton had in a very famous letter of 1887 written to an archbishop called Creton who was extolling the virtues of the popes and the kings and queens of England as heads of the church. And he said that there is a presumption that these people exercise their vast powers only for the benefit of the laity. Baron Acton disagreed and said that if at all there is a presumption the other way and which increases as the power increases. And then comes the oft-quoted sentence, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The next sentence is also very pithy. Great men are often bad men. Interesting. Great men are often bad men. Even though they may exercise influence and not authority. Now, Written constitutions such as ours are meant 
to diffuse power and are meant to see that there is no power that is concentrated in the hands of one authority or individual to the detriment of others. In fact, our constitution is one of the most prolix. It has 395 articles and is in 22 parts, as many as 22 parts. The very first declaration in the first part, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states, gives you a very, very important principle of the diffusion of power, namely the federal principle. Article 3 then goes on to delineate what the states will be and what union territories will be. A union territory being a small area of governance directly by the center, either because it is not an autonomous unit because of financial difficulty or otherwise, and needs to be brought into full statehood if it is so possible. We still have some union territories which cannot, like the Lakshwadip Islands, for example. Apart from part one, you have the great parts three and part four. Now, part three is almost the conscience of the constitution because it is it essentially delineates what citizens' fundamental rights are. And all these rights are to be exercised against the state, as we understand it, that is the legislature and the executive. Part 4 deals with directive principles of state policy, which generally tell the legislatures of, of the country, both centre and state, that it is important never to forget the common man, the weak man, it's very important to remember the weak man, weak in whichever sense, anti-majoritarian equally. And after parts three and four, you have the great principle of separation of powers, which you have in parts five and six. So in part five, you have articles dealing with the executive central, the legislature central, and the judiciary, that is the Supreme Court. And in part six, you have the same Montesquieu division into three parts with the states. And you also deal with subordinate courts, which shall be under the control essentially of the high courts. Now, apart from these parts, you have a very important part 11, which again then distributes legislative power between the union and the states, which we'll talk about a little later. You have part 15, which is crucial to understanding that this is a democratic country because you have an election commission consisting of a chief election commissioner and at the moment two others who actually run the central and state elections that are to take place every five years to the Lok Sabha and to the uh, state legislative assemblies. Apart from these provisions, you have emergency provisions as to when these great principles may be abrogated or abridged, depending on the situation in the country. And part 20, which deals with amendment, most important, which will also advert separately. Now, having given us this constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, one of the main draftsmen, said that what he has given us is a constitution which works, which is flexible, and which is strong. If it does not work, however, man is vile. Very strong words used. What has happened in the recent past in this country is most disturbing. And if I may only share with you four things that have happened this year itself. First, in the beginning of the year, you had a BBC documentary. In fact, you had two documentaries. Speaking about our present Prime Minister, Chief Minister of Gujarat, they were promptly banned. And after the ban, the BBC was harassed by having tax raids upon it. This is the first difficult, questionable incident that took place early this year. Later in the year, you had the Supreme Court decide 
as to how election commissioners should be appointed. Something very, very crucial. Because if election commissioners happen to be partisan, then there is no free and fair election and there is no democracy. So the Supreme Court stated in an interim order that until parliament decides, because article 324 which speaks of the conduct of elections, specifically says that until parliament so decides, it shall be the president. Then went on to say that it would be fair if you are going to have independent persons as election commissioners to have the president, sorry, to have the prime minister, to have the chief justice of India and to have the leader of the opposition as the three persons who will now appoint election commissioners. Most unfortunately, we find that a bill was moved in the Rajya Sabha which has now become an act. Of course, it will go to the Lok Sabha and become an act in, in no time. In which the Chief Justice is substituted by a minister appointed by the Prime Minister. Now, this is the second most disturbing feature because if as a matter of fact you are going to get the Chief Election Commissioner and other Election Commissioner appointed in this fashion, free and fair elections, are going to become a chimera. So this is the second disturbing fact that we found this year itself. The third disturbing fact that we found this year is a governor of a traditionally minority government state, that is Kerala, sitting over bills for periods of up to 23 months. When the Supreme Court wrapped him on his knuckles, what did he do? There were eight such bills. One bill was assented to. Seven bills were referred to the President. Now this again is a very disturbing feature because if there is a wholesale reference to the President, then the legislative activity of the states comes to a standstill. Because unlike a governor, sending back a bill and then after it is sent back the governor then has to sign it once it lands up at the center's door and the center says no that's the death that's the death of the bill it's over so this was the third most disturbing feature this year and the fourth had its impact a tremendous impact on federalism which was the recent supreme court judgment on the abrogation of Article 370. Now, the recent Supreme Court judgment, I'll deal with a little later, but suffice it to say that the moment a state is divided into two union territories, which is what was done here, the first question is why was this done? What was the need? Because you had already had precedence rule in the state. You were administering it from the center. So why did you need this? You needed this because you wished to bypass a very, very important article in Article 356, sub-Article 5. Now, 356 essentially deals with circumstances in which there is a constitutional breakdown in a state and the center takes over. But then it is hedged with conditions. One of the most important conditions being as to time. In no circumstance can it go beyond one year. It is very important to remember. In no circumstance except two, which is given in 356.5. And neither of them obtain. First circumstance is that you should have a national emergency. And the second circumstance is that the election commission should say that elections are not possible in that state. Neither of which opted. So how do you bypass this? You bypass it by this ingenious method of making the state union territories where you have direct central control and no problem as to time. So essentially what has happened is that this could have continued until the Supreme Court decided the matter. In fact, it took four years for the Supreme Court to decide the matter. 
it was in 2019 that the state was declared as two union territories. The decision has just come. And elections, hopefully, are going to be held by September next year. So we have had no democratic government in this state for five years, which could have continued indefinitely. This is a very, very, very disturbing feature. And the Supreme Court did not decide this question. Now, it didn't decide the question because it said, we accept the assurance of the Solicitor General of India that statehood will follow very shortly and that elections will be held. Now, I remember I had said in Shreya Singhal, which was one of my early judgments, when a similar assurance was given to me by the very same Solicitor General, that governments may come and governments may go, but Section 66, capital A of the Information Technology Act goes on forever. What has happened here today is nothing less than this. The Solicitor General does not have the authority to bind any successor government. We are going to have a successor government from May next year. Second, and more importantly, he has no authority whatsoever to bind the legislature. And this is going to be a legislative act. So, to say we won't decide means in effect, you have decided. You have allowed this unconstitutional act to go forward for an indefinite period of time and you have skirted Article 356.5. These are all very disturbing things. So let us now come back to a brief survey of what the constitution says should be done in order to diffuse power and in order to see that things like this don't happen, but then they have happened. If we go to the very first article, which I started with, that India shall be a union of states, the legislative power of the union versus the states is dealt with in part 11. And it is divided very neatly. You begin with article 245, which says that parliament makes laws for the entirety of the country or some part thereof. States make laws for the territory of a state. And that they will have the power to do so depending upon whether the particular subject matter is contained in their legislative list. The union's legislative list is list one in the seventh schedule and consists of 97 entries. It deals essentially with matters of national import as opposed to regional import, national defense, banking, and many, many subjects which are of import for the country as a whole. The state list for which the state legislatures have exclusive power also is contained in list two. It's a shorter list of 66 entries and essentially deals with things like police, public order, local self-government, etc. List 3 is a concurrent power where both the centre and the states may legislate. You have subjects like education, forests, criminal law, contracts, etc. Now, having delineated these spheres, which is why we are really a quasi-federal setup. Why quasi? Because there is a tilt towards the centre, which I will tell you about. And that tilt comes in by Article 248 straight away, which is the residuary article. That everything that you do not find in the state list, Parliament may then legislate upon. So residuary powers which are not mentioned in the list are left only to the centre. The tilt becomes more pronounced as we go forward. You have Article 249 then, where the Rajya Sabha may by a two-third resolution pick up any one matter in the state list and say that henceforth parliament will legislate, not the states. Article 250 is when emergency powers are used and when there is a national emergency, then it may become necessary because of some external aggression or because of armed rebellion within the country for parliament to legislate on exclusively state matters. 
under 252 you have a concept of states giving up their legislative rights to parliament like the urban ceiling act for example was made because land though a state entry entry 18 list 2 was further subdivided to urban land and urban land given up to the center so that you could have a uniform law way of urban land in the entire nation. Under Article 253, even though a treaty may be made with another nation dealing with a state subject, parliament is given the power to ultimately legislate, notwithstanding this scheme that we have. And finally, in Article 254, when the concurrent list is used, Usually, if there is a repugnance between parliamentary and state legislation, parliamentary legislation has to prevail with a proviso that if the president says that this particular state legislation should prevail in that particular state, then the state legislation prevails. Now, this is the broad scheme of division of legislative subjects. And you see how there is therefore a quasi-federal setup where states have exclusive powers to make laws within their care. What happens when we come to legislative activity in the houses of parliament and in the Vidhan Sabhas of the states? First, parliament. Article 79 declares that parliament itself consists of three organs. The president, the House of the People and the Council of States, Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, respectively. It then goes on to tell us in Article 80 that the Rajya Sabha will be made up of 238 members, essentially who are elected by legislative assembly members themselves. And you have, we will also have 12 others who will be otherwise taken from the union territories. So far as the Lok Sabha is concerned, you have a huge mammoth of 550 members, 530 of which are directly elected. And of course, the constituencies are based on population, so that you have UP, for example, having 80 seats because it's the most populous. And some northeastern states having one seat, Nagaland, for example, because they're the least populous. So the important principle so far as these houses is concerned is that whereas one dissolves every five years, the Lok Sabha, so that fresh elections can be held, very crucial thing for democracy. The Rajya Sabha continues, never dissolves, because it has an automatic dissolution of one-third every two years and then a re-election so far as that one-third is concerned and that's how these two houses then ultimately govern our country. Now most importantly, a bill can originate in either house but has to be passed by a majority of both houses. This is a very real safeguard because though there may be a party in the centre who is overwhelmingly elected, that party may not have the same strength in the Council of States. So that this acts as a real check to legislation. And therefore we have all bills except one, namely a money bill, which I'll tell you about immediately. A money bill essentially deals with all taxation and the consolidated fund of India, from which Salaries are paid to everybody, executive, legislature, judiciary, etc. Now, a money bill originates only in the Lok Sabha. The Rajya Sabha is given 14 days to comment on it. If it says something fine, it is then taken into account and ultimately the Lok Sabha can pass it notwithstanding what is said by the Rajya Sabha. Something like what obtains in the House of Lords today. In England, the House of Lords after 1911 and a 1949 Act is now reduced to a body which can only veto, in a sense, 
by sitting over a, a bill for a maximum period of one year because they know that if they make us comment or they say the bill should not be passed then notwithstanding what they say the commons passes it so that particular scheme is followed only where money bills so far as we are concerned and one other safeguard is that ultimately the president has to assent if the president sends it back for with some remarks then again the houses have to consider those remarks and if finally they say sorry we disagree and we pass the bill the president has his no option he must then assent but nonetheless it is a weak form of one further check now so far as the states are concerned and before we come to the states there's one other interesting thing suppose there is a bill which originates in the lok sabha and the rajya sabha says no now that's not an end of the matter because the president may order a joint sitting of the two houses and in a joint sitting if it is then passed by the majority of those who happen to be present and voting then the bill gets passed nevertheless so with this caveat you do have a very real check so far as the rajya sabha passing bills is concerned when it comes to the states unfortunately there are very few states which have a legislative council which is equivalent to the rajya sabha all of them only have legislative assemblies there are very few with councils so you don't have bicameralism so to speak but even where you do where the bill is sent to the legislative council and is sent back and then reset if the legislative council says no the second time then notwithstanding that they say no the second time the legislative assembly prevails so we have a very different scheme so far as the legislative assembly is concerned when compared with parliament now we come to the very interesting thing that i spoke about in the very beginning what does a governor do when he assents to a bill now the governor unlike the president has three choices one he may either assent to the bill or he may say no in fact he has four or he may send it back with some comment or he may refer to the bill to the president now only the second proviso to article 200 gives us some inkling of what kind of bill should be sent to the president second proviso says that if any legislation impacts the high courts then compulsorily it has to be sent to the senate that gives you some idea of what the founding fathers had in mind when they said it is this type of bill that is sent to the senate not every bill but then we have a judgment of our court unfortunately in bk pavitra's case of 2019 which says that there is no constraint on the governor the governor can go ahead and refer every bill if he wants to the president according to me this again requires a revisit and it is important for the federal principle to work for the supreme court to say in unmistakable terms that look this bill is going to ultimately find its death at the president's door because the president says no that's the end of the matter so it is only such bills as impact the nation as all that required to be sent and not others or which impact the judiciary which is what the proviso says so if you constrain this power to send to the president then again we are back on the rails otherwise we are completely off the rails if you have any governor in a state just wholesale sending bills to the president of india who may then make legislative activity come to a complete standstill in an opposition state where are we so this is one other very very important feature that we need to bear in mind now coming to the executive the second great branch of government we have a president who's the head of state now the president is elected unlike a monarch and the president is elected by an electoral college consisting of both the houses of parliament as well as the legislatures of the states we we are so concerned about the president as head of state 
that it is almost impossible to impeach him or her. Impeachment can take place only on the ground that he or she have violated the constitution. The ground is very broad. But you require a two-third majority of the entire house. That is the entire Rajya Sabha and the entire Lok Sabha. And what happens is procedurally, a charge is preferred for impeachment by one house. That charge has to have the requisite two-thirds strength of the entire house. The, the other house then takes up the charge. And if it is found valid, then two-thirds of that house, entire, again have to pass it. Something almost impossible. So you have ensured that your head of state remains in the saddle for five years. It's therefore very, very important to see that you elect somebody who is worthy of being head of state. Like, for example, Dr. Abdul Kalam, there should be a healthy constitutional convention where presidents, governors, etc., that ultimately you elect and or appoint, because governors are appointed, persons only of unimpeachable integrity who then fulfill the various functions they are supposed to fulfill under the constitution. And it is only when you have these people that they deserve this kind of protection, otherwise they don't. When you come to a governor, you have a very different scheme. A governor does, is not elected. Unfortunately, he is only appointed by the center. The article also says he is at the pleasure of the center. So despite the fact that he may have a five-year term, it can get cut short at any point without reason. Now here again, there was a problem with the original constitution which the Supreme Court has tried to iron out. Because in the 2010 judgment, BP Singles judgment, the court said that suppose you have got rid of a governor, which you are entitled to do, you don't have to give reasons. But suppose somebody comes to court and says that it is arbitrary, malafide. Then you will have to tell the court as to why you did it. And you better have a very good reason. Because if you don't, the court will then strike it down. And this notwithstanding that the pleasure doctrine applies. So it was one very important step forward in seeing that independent governors are not thrown out. The corollary according to me is equally important that you must see that a person who is appointed as a governor in the first place happens to be independent. Otherwise the whole, the whole scheme collapses because he has two very important functions in his own discussion which is apart from various other functions. One is what I just told you about, how he ascends to bills. And the other is equally important because he has to send a report under Article 356 to the center if there is a constitutional breakdown in the state. Now, if you have a governor who happens to be part of your political party who has just been kicked up for no other reason but that he should be somehow rewarded, then obviously you are not going to get an independent assessment under either Article 356 or under Article 200. So the scheme qua governors also is fraught with a lot of difficulty. And I am waiting for the day when the Supreme Court will lay down that look, it is only independent functionaries who are supposed to fill these great offices. Not the kind of people that we find today, like we have in Kerala, for example, where wholesale, when after you slept over these bills, you just give them back to the president. Having spoken about the second great branch, we now come to the third and most interesting, my branch, the judicial branch, or our branch, shall we say. Alexander Hamilton, in Federalist Paper 78, now the Federalist Papers were brilliant. There were some 85 of them. And they were divided between three geniuses. Hamilton, who was the first Secretary of the Treasury, who penned 51 of these papers. Madison, who was the father of their constitution, and the fifth president, who penned some 29 of them. And John Jay, who was their first Chief Justice, who penned only 
five of them. Hamilton did most of the work. And Federalist 78 is one of the most brilliant essays that you can read on a free and independent judiciary. He first says that without doubt it's the weakest branch of government. Why? Because it doesn't have force or will. It has only judgment. Also, it does not command the purse, which the legislature has, or hold the sword, which the executive holds. So, it has to depend on the executive to see that its judgments are enforced. Now, having said all this, our founding fathers tried to make the judiciary a little stronger than Hamilton saw. It, saw. In Article 124, it began by saying that, look, you can appoint judges of the Supreme Court, you the president, only if you consult the Chief Justice of India. And the practice was for a good 40 years that basically the president came out with a name, that's the government of India. The Chief Justice said yes or no to it. And then if the government felt strongly enough, it would still appoint the person. All this changed with the second judge's case of nine honorable judges of our court. And nine judges ultimately held that, look, independence of the judiciary is one of the pillars of our constitution. And if you really want an independent judiciary, you have to have the Chief Justice of India who initiates the name. And Really speaking, consultation is not consultation at all. It is concurrence. So therefore, the Chief Justice becomes the important pivot and now no longer the government. So the Chief Justice now, who is read as being a collegium of himself again, to diffuse power of himself and two senior judges, started with two senior judges, will now decide. And there was some textual evidence of the president having to consult other judges at that time, Supreme Court, High Court. So they said, all right, if he is to consult other judges, then surely the Chief Justice himself should consult other judges. And these judges should be, in every case, two other senior judges. Two became five in the presidential reference case, of, again of nine judges of 1998. So, so far as the higher judiciary, the Supreme Court is concerned, you have a collegium now of five judges who really do the appointing. Now, we are often asked this question. How is the collegium system working? I was part of it. I would say, like Churchill said famously, that democracy is the worst form of government except all other forms. So that's how it's working. It is the worst form except all others. We certainly can't revert to the earlier form. So therefore, I'm going to suggest at the end what we should do if you are really going to have a judiciary which is filled with independent fearless judges. So, so this is so far as appointment is concerned. Now, interestingly, there was a constitutional amendment that was passed, the 99th amendment, about seven years ago. And it was almost unanimously passed by both houses of parliament. And what did that amendment say? It said we'll have a Judicial Appointments Commission. The commission will now consist of a Chief Justice, two senior Supreme Court judges, the Law Minister, and persons of eminence who will be appointed by the same trio that was spoken of by Justice Joseph in the Election Commission case, namely the Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition, Chief Justice. This was unanimously struck down by five judges saying, no, you will interfere with the independence of the judiciary and therefore we are back to square one or rather square two because square one was given up earlier. So this is where we stand today so far as appointment is concerned. A Supreme Court is, uh, the judge's tenure is till the age of 65 which is why both of us have retired fairly early and are now enjoying ourselves, fortunately. And importantly, 
the supreme court judges are looked after by the consolidated fund salaries are charged on the fund in every other sense they have a, they have good conditions of work today so that finally we have a superior judiciary who does have a reasonable mix of judges the high courts again have the same kind of system but with two other authorities added you have the chief justice of the high court you have the governor of the state as well and of course primacy given to the chief justice of india's opinion so that finally you have this collegium system there it is three center it's five who essentially appoints the superior judiciary when you have to get rid of judges again you can do so only on impeachment and on two grounds narrower than the president's which if you remember i told you was any violation of the constitution here it is for misbehavior or incapacity and here unlike the president so long as you have two thirds of both houses present and voting that is not the entirety of the house a much lesser number is accepted out goes the judge so so far as judges are concerned they are on a pedestal somewhat lower than that of the president then you have very important articles dealing with the rule of law in this country you have article 141 where the supreme court judgments bind other courts and tribunals you also have article 144 which is a very important article which takes care of what hamilton said that you have to depend on the executive to see that your judgments are followed through here you don't have to depend on the executive you depend on the constitution because the constitution says all authorities whoever they are are bound to follow the supreme court very very important article that has left nothing to doubt and above all article 1453 because 1453 essentially says that the last word on the interpretation of the constitution is with a minimum of 5 judges of the supreme court very 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 important you also have unlike in the united states article 13 which specifically speaks of judicial review of legislation because if you have legislation that violates the constitution which is a higher law that the courts have the power to strike it down and say it is bad now that is not left as was left to the great chief justice marshal to develop case by case that is a specific article of faith in our constitution also you have article 32 which is perhaps the only article of its type in any world constitution that you have a fundamental right to approach the supreme court to enforce your fundamental right it's a remarkable thing that dr ambedkar introduced and said was the soul of our constitution as indeed it is along with this soul comes the high courts under article 226 who do pretty much the same thing and even more because they can protect not just your fundamental rights but other rights as well a wider power now therefore armed with all these powers we have a judiciary who can interpose itself as it's supposed to between a very powerful government a very powerful legislature and the citizens of this country whichever group they be and therefore a lot of the fears of alexander hamilton are looked after by our constitution when you deal with the great judiciary that we have given ourselves now apart from the judiciary we come to the other great important pillars of our constitution you remember we spoke of the election commission now the election commission can be appointed that is the chief commissioner and two other commissioners can be appointed and are appointed by the president of india which is the government of the day you remember i told you that the supreme court suggested that you have this collegium of three consisting of the prime minister 
leader of the opposition and the chief justice. By the way, the Supreme Court didn't pick up a rabbit from a hat. The Supreme Court picked up Parliament's own practice. Because Parliament in 2014, when you appointed the CBI director, somebody of far less relevance at the national level than, 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 than an election commissioner, when you appointed a CBI director, you had the same three by legislation. And look at what has happened today. The Supreme Court, looking at the CBI legislation, that is looking at Parliament at what Parliament itself has done, suggested these three. And these three get subverted instantly by your now passing a bill and it will become an act in no time, where you will have two from the executive, prime minister and minister, against the leader of the opposition, which is two to one always. And out goes the election commission. So there's not much point saying that you're going to appoint a person when you are not sure he's going to be independent. But give him the tenure of five years and that he can be removed. That is, the chief election commissioner can be removed only like a Supreme Court judge. By the way, the other two election commissioners can be removed, but not like a Supreme Court judge. So long as the chief election commissioner says that they may be removed, they can be removed. So the fulcrum, therefore, is the chief election commissioner. And we have to see now how our court reacts when this bill becomes an act, and I'm certain that is going to be challenged. According to me, it should be struck down for the asking as an arbitrary piece of legislation because it severely imperils the independence of the working of the election commission. Because if the fulcrum itself, the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Apart from the election commission, you also have the speakers of legislative assemblies and the union parliament. The Rajya Sabha speaker is the vice president ex officio. Otherwise, the speaker depends upon the majority of the house to appoint him. Now, when persons or when MPs and MLAs get disqualified on various grounds, could be of unsound mind, not citizen of India, undischarged, insolvent, etc. Who is to decide whether this disqualification is correct or not? It can only be the election commission. Again, a very important pointer to the election commission being an absolutely independent body. So the election commission decides and the president then passes the order in accordance with what the commission says. But when it came to defections, IRM and Gayaram, in the 10th schedule, somehow or the other, the speaker became the repository of this confidence. Now, I remember I have in one of my judgments from Manipur seen the working of the 10th schedule right from the 1980s when it was enacted by the 52nd constitutional uh, uh, amendment. And one of the first cases that came to the court was the speaker himself defecting. So much for this great authority, you know, who it's a person who is above board and who's supposed to decide disputes. Now that gentleman defected to become chief minister. And having got, having, having dealt with matters like this, in my experience, I therefore suggested that there be an election tribunal, permanent tribunal, consisting or headed, headed by some retired Supreme Court judge to decide all these disputes. Or at the very least, to have the election commission decide them as in the case of all other disqualification. So this again is one other difficult area which needs to be sorted out because we find that speakers of either the legislative assembly or of parliament very often when it comes to the disqualification on the ground of defection of a person belonging to the ruling party will just sleep over the matter, won't decide, best way of continuing. And if the opposite obtains, then you disqualify the other gentleman instantly. And then he will have to take his time in approaching the courts and God alone knows what will happen after he approaches the courts. So we have these problems. 
and we need to address all these problems apart from the election commission you also have one very very important safeguard in our amendment article now we had various forms of amendment put before the founding fathers they were all very difficult so the founding fathers chose an intermediate route and you have four types therefore of amendment one type of amendment is where like in article 3 you do not do away with a state but you alter the name of a state you may alter its boundaries etc and pass legislation to that effect of course in effect you are therefore altering a part of the constitution the first schedule gets altered but they say that doesn't have to pass the drill of article 368 so that's one type of amendment by ordinary law the second type of amendment is as if you have in article 11 where for citizenship the constitution begins with who are our citizens and then leaves it to parliament in its wisdom to then say whatever it wants about citizens including abrogating provisions of the constitution that's the second type but the most usual type is what falls within four square within article 368 which is if you change any part of the constitution you require to have a two third majority again present and voting of both the lok sabha and the rajya sabha and the amendment then gets passed on the president signing it and then you have the fourth type the fourth type is if you impact certain subject matters such as the election of the president the executive power of the union other states legislative relations between union and states articles 245 to 254 entries in the seventh schedule representation of states in parliament or amendment of the article itself then you require not only two third majority in both houses but also ratification by one half of the states of course a fifth method was tried again in the jammu kashmir case but fortunately the court struck it down what was that fifth method dr dieter conrad had written a very interesting article he was a german professor and germany as you know went through world war 2 and after world war 2 and its experience with hitler and the weimar constitution decided to say that there are certain basic things in their constitution which cannot be touched so he advocated the same thing qua our constitution and gave four very interesting examples telling examples of what would happen if we did not follow basic structure which happens to be a matter of debate again today first he said suppose you were to abolish the constitution and have a monarchy bring back the king can you do it you can if you have the requisite two third majority and you have half the states in your pocket you can do it no problem all right second suppose you abolish article 21 no personal liberty so instantly you are turned from a democracy into a dictatorship by this can you do it third and very interestingly he said suppose you give amendment of the constitution to the president of india and exactly this happened when this slew of government orders were passed for jammu kashmir one very interesting order was that i the president will by my order amend the constitution directly what will i do i say you interpose sub article 4 in article 367 and say that the constituent assembly mentioned in article 370 which is abrogated be now read as legislative assembly this fortunately the court struck down and says no it is not possible so as a matter of fact what dieter conrad envisaged way back in 1966 has actually happened so everything that is envisaged has till today happened so it is very very important therefore to remember that the court has always helped us when we've had troubled times such as when we've had the 39th amendment if you remember 
the 39th amen amendment was only there in order to see that a prime minister who had lost in an election was still prime minister and above the law in short i am not going into it in detail now that 39th amendment would have passed muster because the requisite strength the muscle was there you had the two third majority you had half the states but basic structure stood in the way and interestingly enough four out of those five judges who decided were minority judges in kesavananda bharti who said there's nothing like a basic structure four of them had to apply the majority judgment and each of them gave a different reason as to how basic structure was impacted and the 39th amendment failed so coming to the end fag end now of this long lecture sorry for having detained you people for so long may i only say this we started out if you remember with the four examples i gave you of what's been happening in this country this year the moment there is any onslaught on the media the courts must be vigilant to instantly scotch it if you find that there is some independent reporting which has led to something as a result of which there is a tax raid then for that reason alone without more you must say that tax raid is illegal and unconstitutional that's the only way you can protect the media in this country otherwise you are finished it is the watchdog it is our watchdog and if our watchdog is killed then there's nothing that remains so this is the first important thing that i would like to suggest the second is que governors if you remember have a healthy convention of appointing persons who are independent and i gave the example of dr abdul kalam you have people from who are doing so well in this country from so many walks of life why don't you look for that that pool instead of looking for the pool of your own politicians who, who you wish to somehow or the other push up this is one second very important to overrule or dilute bk pavitra you remember i told you that judgment which says that when a bill comes into the hands of a governor without more he just sends it to the president that's the end of the bill and that's the end of federalism so that needs to be looked into and most importantly when the governor is removed we still fortunately have a judgment which says when he is removed though he is at the pleasure of the center if he is removed mala fide or arbitrarily reasons have to be given to the court and his removal can be set aside so this is so far as governors are concerned the election commission i have dealt with in extent so the election commission also when this matter comes up before the supreme court i hope that this bill which now will become an act will be struck down i sincerely hope because if it is not then it is fraught with the greatest danger to democracy that i can see and finally if i may come to the judiciary itself as i told you earlier we do have our collegium system which is the worst but then there's nothing better now i would only suggest and this is not for the near future this is looking into the distant future i would suggest that you have instead a collegium of retired judges now who will select those retired judges the bar the practicing bar of the supreme court and the high courts because the bar are our judges judges have judges incidentally and we are judged all the time by practicing advocates as bok janak janak and darais will tell you so it is important to have practicing bars all over the country who vote for retired judges like the present who are known for their independence who will then sit with a secretariat be consulted by everybody including the chief justice of india chief justice of high court law minister the works and ultimately recommend persons for the higher judiciary 
if this happens then your present slew of judges where you have outstanding judges in the high court and supreme court then you have a lot of people who are only in transit and you have some who are more executive minded than the executive the proportion within these three will then drastically change and if it drastically changes and mind you this is only my hope for a future god alone knows if it happens and when it happens it is only when that happens that we can honestly say that dr ambedkar's words will no longer hold it thank you all very much apart from the suggestion <coughs> that was made by brother rohinton of how to improve the tone of the appointment of judges i have another suggestion as far as possible in the law schools appoint judges like uh, rohinton to teach constitutional law <laughs> the problem the problem that you have today is constitutional law is taught in schools i'm sorry to say this in the law schools but people who do not know what is a constitution nor the head nor the tail of the constitution the manner in which he has been able to i mean i am reminded of the medical school dissection programs you have a cadaver i'm sorry it, our constitution is yet not a cadaver you have a cadaver you dissect it find out which uh, nerve goes where which um, blood vessel touches what what bone is there and all that. this is the manner in which any law should be served, taught much more the constitutional law uh, as far as his last suggestion is concerned i am happy that i won't be alive in the near in that kind of distant future to be a part of this kind of mechanism we need independent judges is something that cannot be done away with it but unfortunately independence of judges is eroded because of uh, excessive pressure from the executive which may be in terms of uh, indirect pressure i will not take it further than that if not on account of lack of integrity it's a pity that they should have accepted the proposal to increase the age of the supreme court judges by 272 years now at least when he was there on the bench they would have refused to the government would have con consistently refused to do it even now they can do it i'm sure there are some good judges in the supreme court and who can be allowed to continue <coughs> for some more time uh, i'm happy that we were given today a lecture which is worthwhile listening to on a intricate subject like constitutional law and that to the big tome that we have in the indian constitution and thanks to rohinton so many of the nooks and crannies of the indian constitution have been very well illuminated i hope the thoughts expressed by him are picked up by the media and despite all the problems that they have projected sufficiently so that every right thinking citizen of this country has access to such lucid thoughts such thoughts which are fundamental in the governance of the country thank you very much ladies and gentlemen it has been a pleasure listening to uh, honorable justice rohinton nariman and gone back on what you said why is it only the privilege of the executive why can also do it why should only the government be blamed for going back on things they went back on so many things i will go back on this small thing and it has been a pleasure to be with all of you this tonight thank you very much and 
I, being an eternal uh, optimist, still think that there is some hope for the country. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to give uh, an official vote of thanks. Uh, Justice Sri Krishna has already thanked Rohintan. Um, Justice Nariman to some, Rohintan to many, and to, if I may say so, to his very, very close friends, Ro, uh, is one in a million. Uh, you've... you've heard a typical Nariman lecture, which really means it's erudite, it's simple, and in a word, it's brilliant. And this is not restricted to the law. As was said earlier, uh, Rohintan has delivered lectures on a wide variety of subjects and uh, I believe they are all available on YouTube. And I do commend that if you have not heard them, uh, you should do so. Because uh, each one is an education in itself. I've known Rohintan since I was six and he was seven and we played badminton occasionally and played the fool a lot uh, at the PVM Gymkhana. And ever since then we've sort of grown up together, he in Cathedral, me at Bombay International, uh, he in college in Delhi. I in college in Bombay and then we joined the bar. He briefly uh, graced the Bombay High Court before moving uh, to where his natural place was, namely the Supreme Court. But if I have to point out one facet of Rohintan which really puts him apart from everyone else and by everyone else I mean everyone else of very high intelligence <laughs> it's his memory and I think unless you know him personally and know him well you can't have the slightest idea of what I'm saying and so instead of describing his memory in sort of vague terms and saying it's phenomenal and he's a modern day Macaulay and things like that, I thought I could uh, use this occasion to just give you three out of hundreds of examples that I have personally experienced of his memory. Let me start with one memory uh, in, in, in the law. We were appearing together with a host of other counsel in a group of petitions in the Supreme Court challenging the luxury tax on tobacco. And one day, uh, in the lunch break, as we were walking out of the Chief Justice's court, it was before a constitution bench, Harish Salve buttonholed Rohintan and said, Ro, there's that one proposition in that one judgment, I want to cite it in the afternoon. I, of course, knew why Harish had asked Rohintan. And there and then, in my presence, Rohintan gave the citation 
but that was not all because there can be quite a few lawyers who would do that rohintan mentioned the page on which the proposition that harish was searching would be found and sure enough post lunch harish opened that particular volume of supreme court reports and read out that passage in 2014 i spent a delightful 10 days with rohintan and sanaya uh, at their beautiful house in nainital and we were watching a dvd on the history of the hittite empire now i must presume that in this erudite audience many of you will have heard of the hittite empire but i equally venture to suggest that a very 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 large part of the populace in this country would not have heard of the hittite empire and we were approaching a particular incident which was some great battle between the hittites and some other empire which whose name i have already forgotten rohintan mentioned the year of that battle i think it was 1400 ad or 1270 ha huh? he mentioned the name of the battle he mentioned the name of the two generals and he mentioned the outcome of that battle i'll only give one more example because otherwise you'll be here for a very long time and i don't want that to happen and this may be a slightly a uh, frivolous example but even frivolous examples can give an indication of a man's memory we were having a walk in mahableshwar and we somehow got round to the topic of pg wodaus now i am a great great pg wodaus fan uh, so is rohintan and suddenly he said you know on those penguin paperbacks that wonderful description by evelyn war so i said yeah that thing which says something about pg wodaus's uh, world is eternal and something he said yes but don't you know it so i said ro i've read it but i mean what do you mean know it and you will not believe this he recited that entire paragraph which you find at the back of every single pg wodaus paperback word perfect so this gives you some idea of what really puts rohintan i do venture to suggest apart from everybody else and i don't uh, i don't mean it as disrespect to anyone uh, least of all people in this audience but but really that's the one thing that puts him apart it isn't gentlemen you've heard about his vast knowledge in a wide variety of subjects and uh, i don't want to bore you with that so let me end as i did uh, when i introduced dr udwadia at a lecture at uh, the asiatic which i think uh, homi khushru khan had organized because i believe it's as apt for him uh, for rohintan uh, as it is uh, as it is for dr udwadia uh, i am not surprised that minal shirsagar referred to him as the quintessential renaissance man and i am going to talk and quote the quintessential renaissance man in 1482 the young 29 year old leonardo da vinci traveled from florence to milan 
and he wrote a letter seeking employment with the duke of milan and in it he described and enumerated the 12 things in which he thought he was very good and competent and it included the modeling of armaments the making of machines etc etc and he ended that letter with the words i may also inform my lord that i also paint <laughs> i think if someone were to ask rohintan what do you do well could he echo leonardo da vinci and say i also practice the law <laughs> rohintan thank you for a splendid lecture justice shri krishna thank you for gracing the occasion i think we should thank uh, the committee headed by minal shri sagar for having persuaded or enticed rohintan to come uh, to our society i say as because i happen to be a trustee of this uh, august organization and last but not least as one always does uh, i'd like to thank the audience for taking time well worth taking the time on a friday evening to attend this lecture thank you Thank you.